This is a special Newsmaker podcast from Hoosier Ag Today. At HAT, we interview people making news and having an impact on agriculture around the state and around the world. We are now talking with the outgoing director of the Indiana State Department of Agriculture, Ted McKetty, who is also the incoming uh, Undersecretary of Agriculture for Trade and Foreign Affairs, a new position at USDA. Uh, It has been a long uh, process, one that Secretary Purdue certainly would have liked to have seen uh, uh, move along a lot quicker, but it did move along without any major uh, problems. So, uh, again, getting ready to... uh, to start work at USDA. Uh, Ted, I guess, first of all, um, what do you see as one of the first areas that you're going to focus on? Obviously, you know, looking at trade, a key issue uh, for farmers, a key issue for the USDA, a key issue for the uh, Trump administration. What do you see as one of the first areas in terms of trade that, that you're going to be able to address? Well, Gary, first, thanks for this uh, opportunity. Uh, I'm keeping my uh, promise that you would be the first, so it's so good to visit with you. Um, Well, the first thing I think I've got to make sure I do is ensure uh, alignment with what Secretary Perdue uh, is seeking. He and the president uh, in the area of trade, you know that other organizations like U.S. Trade Representative, uh, Commerce, Department of State all have a stake in that. But in my case with Secretary Perdue and those who have been so capably working the ag trade, ag foreign affairs piece uh, in this interim since the election. So I want to I want to get a good grounding. Now, what I think you're getting at is how we're going to go make change. And I suspect that after I get that grounding and make sure there's alignment and understand uh, what the administration sees as the priorities, I'm betting I'll find myself in an airplane seat or two or three or four because trade is still based in many parts, dare I say all the parts of the world, on trust and knowledge of people and, um, you know, delivery of facts, you know, volume and quality and variety of products and the diversity of products. So I'm guessing that I'm, I'm going to be communicating quite a bit and building uh, that trust to make sure that markets – Uh, either are opened if they're not already open or that we remain uh, and keep them open. So I I say those seem large and abstract, but I think they're the truth, to be honest. The Trump administration in the United States is undergoing a change in philosophy on trade, moving from uh, multilateral agreements to, to bilateral agreements. And so how will you go about communicating that change and the rationale for that change and convincing some of our trading partners, some of which we have agreements with, some of which we may not? How are you going to approach that in terms of talking to our uh, uh, our customers and, and potential customers uh, about these kind of trade deals and, and the different approach that the United States is taking uh, regarding trade, particularly in agriculture? Uh, it's, no, it's a very, very good question. Well, once again, I'm going to make sure I'm grounded with what uh, the administration seeks to advance. And, and I'd say notably Secretary Purdue and, 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 and newly, newly minted uh, Deputy Secretary uh, um, Steve Sensky, who I've known for years, but but I think I think basically um, uh, once we once we have down the the messages we want to communicate, it's just a matter of um, of, of getting out there and doing that. Uh, I, I think one there's, while there's been change in messaging, uh, perhaps there are many things that have not changed. I mean, the U.S. is still. Uh, and incredible, dare I say, in most products, the world's largest provider of food products, be it uh, commodities or processed, uh, those still remain of very high quality. Uh, I don't know if it's too cliche to say we're the world's breadbasket, but in many ways that's true. And so as long as the uh, countries around the world understand that that has not changed and that maybe how we get there uh, uh, you know, may, may be changing, may not be changing, but but in, may, in some cases may. But I think it makes the way easier. I still think, though, it comes back to trust. Can the U.S. and will the U.S. be that reliable supplier of high-quality, 
in many cases, high volume products? And I think the answer to that is absolutely and unequivocally yes. Have you had the opportunity to talk with uh, Secretary Purdue or gotten any indication uh, what kind or what level of involvement you will have in uh, the negotiations that are ongoing, the NAFTA treaty in particular, the Korean Free Treaty Agreement, which, again, you know, uh, the USTR handling that, taking the lead on that. But do you know what role or what that you will play or that you would like to play in terms of, of being agriculture's voice in those those key uh, trade, trade negotiations that are currently ongoing? Sure. Well, we have not discussed the exact nature and the exact next steps forward, but we have heard from him, uh, both privately and publicly, that he expects – my role and me, and I would say by extension the team that I'll be with, uh, to be at the fore, at the table, leading on ag discussions. Now that said, all my life I've worked with teams. You know, I've managed down to subordinates. I've managed sideways a great deal of my life. And yes, like most of us, we've managed up at some point uh, in many cases. And it's going to take all of those. Given the approach that the U.S. has to trade, which I still think is a good one, dare I say one of the best in the world, it is a collegial process where we do have the U.S. Trade Representative's Office, very important office. We have the Department of State. We have Commerce. And we have others that are very important. And not intentionally, I'm not leaving USDA to be last because uh, at the Congress's action – and then uh, uh, Secretary P- Purdue enacting th- that request, we have remade this office. And so I expect that this one will be at the fore, uh, certainly at the table, if not leading those. But it's a collegial process, and I respect that. I've always played well in sandbox, and that's why I think the Happy Warrior moniker uh, fits so well. I want to be a great team player, you know, perhaps the best we've had. And at the same time, we all have to be warriors because there are lots of things we've got to fix. How big of an issue is it going to be? I mean, because this is a new position, so you're going to have to create a. uh, There's not a job description there. (laughs) You just have to create this team, create this internal working system within USDA, probably bringing together different people out of different departments that uh, have have focused on this in the past. How big of a challenge is the the internal rearrangement as a result of this new position? going to be? Well, having not been in the chair yet, uh, I'll have to speculate, but I'd start by saying that the Foreign Ag Service has a function. The the action of U.S. agriculture and food trading around the world is not new. So we, I think, have a very good base to start from in that. What's new is that this is now singular focused, and I love that. I I think the Congress in the 2014 Farm Bill and Secretary Purdue's action in lifting it up and making it happen was exactly right at exactly the right time. And so I'll tell you, it's more – I think it's it's more fun to establish a new role than, than sometimes to follow in others' footsteps. But we've got a great roadmap to go from. And I'm just thankful that we can dedicate the time, 100% or more, uh, to doing just that. I think it'll work just fine. We've got many templates to work from. You touched on this a little bit in your comments, but what do you see as the, the one of the selling points as you go to people that uh, around the world that are perhaps not doing business with the United States now uh, or not doing as much business as we would certainly like them to, to do in agriculture? Uh, what's going to be the selling point? What is it about American ag products that is, is going to be for you one of the, the, the real key points that you need to stress? Sure. Well, I hope the size – and the magnitude of our production, and again, that transcends all kinds of crops and livestock. I hope that's a selling point. In other words, ready supply for a world that's demanding ever more protein, whether it's a wealthy country or a developing country, there is the supply and it's there. I also think that the the world continues to look at the U.S. for a reliable and quality and safe food supply. At a time when others are struggling with that, year in, year out, you can depend on the safety 
and the quality uh, of, of U.S. products. So I think that is the second one. The third is, I think, the incredible ability of a free democracy like ours to diversify and meet different customer needs. Call it market segmentation if you want, but whatever uh, a country might want, there's a better than even chance that someone or someones in the U.S. can deliver on that. And then finally, I, I think we are a reliable supplier. I absolutely believe that. Uh, there's a heart for that. There's a compassion for delivering needed protein. And and so when you when you mix all those in a mixing bowl and stir it up, it makes for a pretty darn good package of points to deliver to our trading partners. And then it's just the person who I hope to be that person that has a lot of trust and integrity that uh, can then deliver on those promises. That's that's uh, that's the way I look at that right now. We've tended to focus on food, but uh, the U.S. agriculture has much more to offer, and one of those we've seen recently is an area that you have quite a bit of experience in here in Indiana, and that is in the biofuels and renewable energy sector, as you have really been involved in growing that sector here in the Hoosier State. Do you think that's uh, an area that the U.S. agriculture, we're going to see more interest in, more growth in, more opportunities? in for, for U.S. producers uh, around the world as more and more countries uh, adopt renewable energy? G- Gary, I, I am bullish on biofuels. Uh, now, I'll start by saying the wild card out there, if you're looking at automotive, is the whole idea of battery technology and electric vehicles. So there's a bit of an unknown. I think that's emerging as a part of the mix. But we know now that we have fuel standards to meet. We have now, in all countries, uh, the need to ensure a clean air uh, and fuel efficiency. And we know that biofuels help deliver that, maybe even are the sole mechanism for delivering on some of these lofty goals. So for that reason, around the world, And because we are once again such an enormous producer of products that go into biofuels, let's just start with corn and soy as an example or examples, then then I would say uh, we've got, again, I'll say a better than even chance. And if I was bold, I'd go well beyond that to say we can be the supplier of those kinds of biofuels. And gosh, we're not done yet. We're still in the first 100 yards of a marathon, if I can draw that analogy, in terms of how you apply technology to crops, whether it's biotechnologies for food, uh, biotechnology, or other technologies for biofuels. I think we're going to get better and better over time. And once again, as we have tended to be, I think we can be a global supplier of these and other products. You mentioned biotechnology, and again, your experience working for biotech companies, uh, do you feel there is gradually becoming, uh, you know, because biotechnology, the approval of traits has been a bit of a barrier going in forward. Is that going to be less of an issue? Is that something that your office will help in terms of of moving uh, approval of these products along to to help this technology continue to increase uh, production both here in the United States and around the world? Well, I would anticipate, as has been the case, that, that, that the office and the good people with whom I'll work will continue to advocate for any and all kinds of food. And yes, that absolutely includes products used through biotechnology methods. Um, I, I don't think the world wants to turn the clock back on that because the benefits have simply been enormous. But that said, there are parts of the world that want something different, and that's okay if they are willing to pay oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes the added cost for a product used without some of those technologies, then I'll, I'll say repeatedly, we, we find farmer after farmer that's willing to step up, fill that niche, and do so in a quality and safe uh, manner. I think one of the things we learned through particularly the Indiana Grown program is that you can have a big tent, and inside that tent, people can get along. So I'm more interested in not having one sector tear down another sector at their own expense 
Uh, rather, I'm interested in lifting them all up. And I think the globe, the world is demanding different types of products in different sectors for different needs. Let's see if we can't uh, build on that success we've seen in fulfilling niche or large commodity markets and deliver what people want. That said, I'll continue always, as we have seen over the many, 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 many decades through my and your and others' ancestors, we've got to continue to look at and attempt that best introduction and adoption of technology. It has saved the world uh, from millions and millions of people dying. We've been looking forward. Let's take a quick look back uh, as we begin to wrap things up here. Uh, in Indiana, you're fairly short, but certainly very productive uh, stint as a director of the State Department of Agriculture. What are some of the things that, that you're most proud of uh, that have been accomplished over really the last two, three years? Oh, gosh, that's that's a tough question. Well, I'm going to start with my team. Um, uh we, we have always had a great Indiana State Department of Ag, and my hat is off to all of my predecessors. And to take what they've built and build upon that with, with an even more competent and even more quality team who are pushing the boundaries in all areas, policy, programs, soil water conservation, is just um, – it's heartwarming. So I start with, always with, with team. Uh, I would say specific programs that just can't help but be uh, called out. The Indiana Grown Program I mentioned before, and we're so proud of that. And not only are we proud of the 914 members, we continue to add about one or more a day on the average. It's not so much the program as much as it is the fact that we've demonstrated that everybody can play uh, under that big tent together, and we don't have to denigrate each other based on our method or types of production. So, so I'd say that's one. Uh, uh, I couldn't be more proud of uh, of the messaging and the strategic planning we've done. Um, we participated actively in the statewide strategic plan, so we we held our own and did our part there. But go deeper, and the, the dairy strategy is the gift that keeps on giving. We're working on a hardwood strategy. We're working on a beef processing strategy. And in time, we'll do others. And in that way, we're doing great science, great research to say, all right, these are complex markets. How do we go about it? Uh, I think the market reporting is exciting. Yet to come, Land Resource Council is going to be very important in its work so that local county commissioners, councilmen, boards of zoning appeals can look at a well-thought-out plan or set of plans and say there's a good model on how we should treat the siting of livestock barns or cropping or other kinds of things. So uh, I, would, I, would, uh, I, would, I would say those as well. And I'm a huge and, – and I'm just a fanatic for youth – uh, I'll remind you that Indiana FFA continues to set high water marks on memberships every year, and the National FFA Convention is thriving here. Uh, you know, the bid is in now for Indy to chase that for the 2025 to 31 years, and if we can land that, boy, that'll be. Uh, I'll even toast myself with a good glass of milk if we land the second round of that. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good. If I'm unfortunate, you'll probably be on an airplane someplace uh, and miss a good deal of the convention. So we'll we'll miss you in that regard. But uh, what do you see as one of the biggest challenges as your predecessor, uh, or your your successor rather, comes in, uh, takes over the department? Uh, what do you see as some of the the, the challenges uh, that he or she will face, and and goals that the, the the department really needs to to focus on in the coming years? Yeah, I'd zero in on three, and I would start by saying they're all positive, and they all can be achieved or managed. The first one is I think all of Indiana agriculture must lift up the plan that everyone spent so much time on. It is a good roadmap. It's not so specific that you're scripted and can't be flexible, but nor is it so broad that you don't know what direction to take, and that's something that everybody – not the least being my successor, needs to, uh, to take on. The second thing is just the whole area of economic development. And I mean the activities that we've done inside the Department of Ag, 
but I most certainly hold up the collaboration that we've seen so successful with the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, or IDC. Um, Gary, it's just rocking. I mean, this is Indiana's time for business development, and that absolutely includes food and ag. So sustaining that collaboration with IEDC and any other partners is, is, uh, is a must. And I also think the work of the Land Resource Council has to fit in there. I'll remind everybody that um, you know, locals determine zoning. They determine what goes where. But with certainty, the state has been asked, and we have to be asked to participate. But they have been asked, and that includes us, on how do we go about siting a manufacturing plant, a livestock barn, subdivisions and housing? How do you go about that? Are, are there appropriate setbacks? Are there inappropriate setbacks? How do you do wind? How do you do solar? Where do they mix? And the Land Resource Council is just a stellar group of people that are still in the early work of, uh, of identifying that. Now, they've got a lot of work from the first round when, that, uh, when they met a, a few years ago. We're now in the second revival of that, and, and I think that can be transformative. If I had to throw a, four, a fourth thing in there that relates to that is the importance of broadband. Rural Indiana, and that absolutely includes all of agriculture, uh, needs and must rely on a capable, functioning broadband. So there are four things for you to, to think over. The governor will be announcing uh, uh, who will take over the Department of Agriculture before you leave town. Uh, have you made a recommendation, or will you be making a recommendation of the governor as to uh, who should head up ISDA? Well, I, I'm not sure when the governor or lieutenant governor will make the announcement. I'm guessing it will not be before I depart town. And I think they want to do it right, the, the correct thing, and, and, and they can, they're afforded that opportunity because, A, the team at ISDA is working so darn well, and the uh, interim uh, director was named today, and that's, that's my own deputy, Melissa Reckaway, and she is, a, she is an all-star. Uh, in fact, it brings great pleasure that she'll probably upgrade it even without my being there. She's that capable. So uh, once they identify someone, I'm sure they're going to be very, very capable. I have heard names. I've talked to some people, but I think I should probably keep that confidential. Just know that I, I am not worried about them finding a successor, and I have every confidence they'll find a pretty darn good upgrade to the program. Well, as members of the media, we certainly wouldn't mind it if you spilled a few names, but I understand that uh, the governor might not appreciate <laughs> that. Ted, we certainly wish you the best of luck in uh, in your new venture. Uh, we certainly want to thank you for all the cooperation, uh, not only that you have given Hoosier Act today, but certainly all of us in the, the Indiana Ag community, uh, communications business, that you have always been accessible and, uh, and uh, communicative, uh, and uh, we certainly appreciate that it helps uh, Indiana agriculture uh, stay uh, informed, and that is uh, uh, important as well. So we certainly wish you the uh, the best of luck in uh, in your p- new position in Washington, and uh, certainly looking for good things from uh, the USDA. Well, thank you, Gary, and uh, let's don't be strangers. Uh, I, I'd be happy to stay in touch. All the best to you and that. Thank you, Ted McKinney, the outgoing director of the Indiana State Department of Agriculture and the incoming Undersecretary of Agriculture for Trade and Foreign Affairs at USDA. This is Hoosier Ag Today. Thanks for listening to a special Newsmaker podcast from Hoosier Ag Today, Indiana's farm network.